morning and welcome to Potlington Christian Fellowship Sunday morning service. My name is Alan and I'm just leading us through uh, what God has uh, ready for us this morning. And I can't wait to hear his word and to feel his presence with us. So let's dedicate this immediately to, to him, asking that he will be with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and we pray that as we watch this video at home, that you will be with us, that no one will feel lonely, no one will feel separated, but because the Spirit of the living God will rest upon us. Holy Spirit, come into our homes just right now. Come into our homes, touch our lives. Let us know your love once again, that we might enjoy sweet fellowship with you. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I asked myself the question this week in preparing for this morning, what was Jesus doing a week before Easter, which is where we're at uh, as we watch this. On the Sunday before Easter, Jesus began his trip to Jerusalem. It all really began to pan out from that week before. He knew that he would soon be laying down his life for our sins. And as he got near to the village of Bethpage, he sent two of his disciples ahead, telling them to look for a donkey and its unbroken colt. The disciples were instructed to untie the animal and bring it to Jesus. Then Jesus sat on the young donkey and slowly, humbly, made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, fulfilling the ancient prophecy of Zechariah, when he said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, daughters of Jerusalem! See, your king comes to you, riding and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. The crowds welcomed Jesus. They waved palm branches in the air and shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Bless is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On Palm Sunday, Jesus and his disciples spent the night in Bethany a town about two miles east of Jerusalem. This is where Lazarus, who Jesus had raised from the dead, and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, lived. They were close friends of Jesus and probably hosted him and his disciples during the final days in Jerusalem. The people were excited with Jesus as he entered Jerusalem. Oh, that that excitement might permeate through our lives, that we might too be excited when we think of our Lord and Saviour. And at that point, he wasn't anybody's Saviour because it was a week before he died for us. The people sang, they waved branches, they put their coats down on the floor, they shouted, Hosanna, he is the coming king, riding on a donkey, almost a contradiction. But you know, it shows the servitude of Jesus, the humility that he had, that we should have that we don't claim anything as our own, but all things are to his glory. As Gillian leads us in praise and worship, let's join in with our voices too. Letting Jesus know we welcome him here this morning into our homes. Thank you.
Jill. Later in the week, following his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus instituted a simple but hugely significant memorial. He says to all his people down through time, I want you to remember me by eating bread and drinking wine. He went on, these represent my broken body and shed blood, the price of our salvation. So right now we just come before the Lord. If you have the emblems ready, please do partake of them. Lord, I thank you for your broken body. I thank you that you died on that cross for me. And we want to remember you as you told us. So right now we just take hold of the bread. And in the name of Jesus, it becomes part of us. Thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood. Thank you for the wine to represent that. And we pray that as we <coughs> partake of this wine, that we will again appreciate your blood and the cleansing that we have through it. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, I pray that as people all over this area partake of communion again today 
that the reality of it won't pass us by, that it won't just be a formality, but it will be a lifeblood to us, remembering that you are the source of all good things. We pray now that as we listen to your word, that you will speak to us for your glory. Amen. Hello everyone. I'd like to begin today by reading three scriptures. And those scriptures are from Proverbs, Matthew and Revelation. Ears that hear and eyes that see, the Lord has made them both. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, Many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. During the last two times that I've spoken, I talked firstly about God's work of repositioning us during this time, and that God's work of repositioning us was going to be outworked through the works, sorry, the words that he speaks to us individually and which we then go on to faithfully deliver to the rest of the body. And secondly, about carrying the word and that we are blessed and highly favoured that God has created us to be vessels in which his word can be conceived and then grown and developed as we carry that word before releasing it at the appointed time. I'd like to backtrack a little today to talk about receiving the word. In the first letter that he wrote to the Corinthians when talking about the Lord's Supper, Paul wrote, For I passed on to you what I also received from the Lord. Paul couldn't pass on to them what he hadn't first received from the Lord. In order to deliver the word faithfully to the rest of the body as the prophets of old did, we must first receive the word. So that's why I'd like to talk today about receiving the word. And I've realised that what I'd like to share about receiving the word is too much to do so all at once. So this is receiving the word part one and it remains to be seen how many other parts there will be um, to follow. So last time I said that God desired relationship and so he created mankind to be in relationship with. And because relationship is built through communication, God has always communicated himself to mankind and always will do. A working relationship exists where there is two-way communication between each party. And that is, both parties communicate themselves to the other and also receive what the other is communicating to them. God has created us with the ability to live in relationship to him and with the capability for there to be two-way communication between us and God. God is spirit and he has made us in his image. So we are spirit with a soul temporarily housed or clothed in a physical body. A physical body enables us to engage and interact with the physical world around us. And our physical body has five senses that we are very familiar with and well accustomed to using. They of course are our senses of sight, hearing, taste, touch and smell. Those senses of our physical body mirror the senses that God has created us with in our soul. Now God, as we said, is spirit. And he communicates with us spirit to spirit, his spirit to our spirit. What God communicates to himself and to our spirit, the senses of our soul pick up and then and feed that to the heart and then the heart with God's enabling and in his light and with his knowledge and his wisdom effectively process what the senses of our souls have perceived from the spirit 
and accurately interpret it so that what is then passed on to our natural mind is truth. Our natural minds govern how we interact and engage with the world around us. So when our heart passes on or communicates truth to our natural mind, our interactions with the world around us are governed by truth and therefore they are what God wants and intends for them to be. Now God's communication with us spirit to spirit is this continuous flow, his spirit to our spirit, into our souls, and through our bodies and out into the world. This continuous flow that sin severed, but through Jesus' sacrifice, he perfectly restored. The effect of sin severing that spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship and that spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication between us and God was to subject and condemn mankind to what I'm going to call a physical, soulish loop. God created us to be spirit-led, to be, live from the spirit. For God to um, communicate directly to our spirit and for the senses of our soul to be spirit-facing so they would receive what God was communicating to us. And then our hearts would process what the senses of our soul had perceived and pass that on to our physical mind. And then our physical mind, governed by truth, would dictate how we interact and engage with the world around us. It's a bit of a crude way of describing our hearts, but in one sense, our heart is just a processor. It just processes whatever it's fed and can only process what it's fed. So a bit like the stomach of our physical body, whatever you put into it, it will try and digest. Whether that is a good thing or a bad thing for us, it cannot help but function as a stomach and just try and digest it. And that's how our hearts are internally in the spirit. It will just um, process whatever it has picked up and whatever it has been fed. Now God of course designed that, our hearts to be fed directly from his heart. But sin put an end to that. There was no longer anything for the senses of our soul that had been spirit facing to perceive in the spirit. There was just a void, an emptiness, because that spirit to spirit relationship between us and God had been cut. But our hearts still there and still function and were looking for something. So they turned, the senses of our soul turned from being spirit facing to being physical facing. And whereas God had created our physical body to be our servant, to be a tool through whom and by whom the kingdom of God could be established here on the earth, the order that of our being that God had created, that spirit-led being, um, spirit, soul and then body, that was reversed. And so, as I say, the senses of our soul that had been spirit-facing turned to being physical-facing. And the physical body that had been our servant, a tool by and through whom the kingdom come, it reversed and it became our master and we became dominated by the physical. So what our physical senses perceive and picked up from the physical world around us, it's that that then was communicated to our heart and which the sense of our soul would perceive and receive. And then in the darkness of our own understanding, without God's enabling, without his light or his knowledge or his wisdom, our hearts would ineffectively process what the physical senses had picked up from the world around us and inaccurately um, interpret that. So that what was then fed to our natural mind was no longer truth, but a lie, a distortion of truth, a delusion. So the interactions with the world around us became governed by a lie, a delusion. A distract, uh, sorry, a distortion of truth. 
that of course has consequences. No longer were we interacting with the world around us as God has intended and how he desired. So we've seen things that God never meant for us to see, hear things that we've never meant to heard. And the same with our the senses of our uh, taste and, and smell and, and touch. We've encountered things that God never designed for us to do so. And then, of course, that was all fed back to our hearts once again in the darkness of our own understanding without God's enabling in the absence of his wisdom and knowledge our hearts could no longer effectively process that or accurately interpret it so further lies further distortion of truth and delusion is communicated to our natural mind for our interactions they remain governed by our natural mind so once again we are interacting and engaging with the world around us governed by a lie of course, that leads to further consequences. And again, we see, hear, taste, touch and smell things that we are never, we weren't designed to, that are alien to us. And that is fed back to our hearts. So you see this physical soulish loop going round and round and round. And that is what sin subjected mankind to, but that Jesus interrupted and perfectly restored through his sacrifice that spirit to spirit communication, that continuous flow from God's heart to our heart. So it is when the senses of our soul return to being spirit facing that we are able to receive the word and then carry it and it gets developed within our hearts and then our physical bodies as they return to being our servant, through the senses, the abilities of our natural body, we are then able to release and birth that world in the physical world around us for the benefit of, of that world. So what is it that causes the senses of our soul to return to being spirit-facing? Well, I like you all to cast your minds back to that moment just before you were about to enter your mother's birth canal. And I'd like you to recall the high levels of stress and anxiety, and anxiety that you experienced at that time. The huge sense of responsibility that was laid upon your little shoulders. And the stress and anxiety, it wasn't on account of the fact that you were about to be pushed, squeezed, perhaps even pulled through an impossibly small space, but because you were acutely aware of the world that awaited you outside your mother, the safety of your mother's womb, all that was going to be required of you, all that you were going to have to do from the moment that you were born. You were aware that you needed to arrange for your senses to be, the physical senses of your body, to be immediately stimulated and continually exercised in order for you to go on to develop the skills and abilities that you were going to need that were essential for your survival in that world out there. And then for you also to be able to go on and thrive in that world. Now, of course, unless you are very unusual, in which case we'd all be very interested to talk to you and hear your story, you of course cannot cast your mind back to that moment. And you cannot recall that time. Because at that time, you were utterly unconscious, completely unaware of your own existence. Yet, it was true that from the moment you were born, the senses of your physical body did need to be stimulated and to be continually exercised in order for you to then go on and develop the skills and abilities that you would need to survive in that world and thrive in that world. Skills and abilities such as walking and talking. So how is it that although we were utterly unaware of our own existence at that time and also probably for the next two or three years, but it remained true that our senses did need identifying, they did need exercising and stimulating in order for us to develop those skills. How is it that here we are all today, walking and talking? Well, as with all things, it's thanks to God. 
You see, God created our physical bodies with those five senses that we need. And he arranged for those to be stimulated from the moment that we were born and then to, be, to go on and be continuously exercised so that they could fully develop and form and enable us to develop the skills and abilities we need, such as walking and talking. You see, from the moment you were born, you would have been exposed to light for the first time. Somebody would have picked you up and held you. And you would have smelt the scent of each person that held you and, and touched you. Soon you would have tasted milk for the first time. And you would have heard the voices of the people around you. The people would have spoken directly to you. God had arranged for you to be born into a family and into an environment who would exercise your senses for you, who would stimulate them and demonstrate to you the skills and the abilities that you would need to go on and learn. And the adults in your life, they would have been intentional and purposeful in the ways that they interacted with you. They would have had the knowledge that they needed to stimulate your senses for you and exercise them. And they would have exposed you to all sorts of different environments and situations that would have contributed to your development. You know, they would have maybe sat you on their knee before you could sit up by yourself and read you a book when you couldn't even identify a book, what a book was, let alone understand what was being read to you. And they would have pointed things out to you and told you what they were called. And they would have given you all sorts of different foods to taste, to try, and many you probably didn't like very much, but some you would have liked. And you would have been exposed to all sorts of different smells in the world around you. And probably the most noxious of those smells you would have been responsible for yourself at that young age. And you would have um, heard many things you would have, because you would have been spoken to. People would have continually spoken to you and talked to you, even though you did not understand what was being said. And of course you would have felt the touch of the people that carried you, held you, stroked you, caressed you and, and played with you. And all that your parents and the adults that you in your life would have done, much of what they did would have been in faith. Because it took a while for you to for your eyes to actually focus on them for the very first time. But there was that day, that day that did come when your eyes did focus with your, your parent for the first time and they had the joy of knowing that their child had actually seen them. And there was that day that came when they called your name, that you turned in recognition that you were being called. And that day when you said your first word, and quite likely that could have been mum or dad. And this is reflective of how God is with us in the exercise of our senses. He relates to us in faith. He stimulates the senses of our heart in faith knowing that it doesn't matter that we may not understand or even be aware of our own existence to start off with, but he keeps speaking, he keeps communicating to us, knowing that as he is doing that, that is awakening our senses. It's enabling us to identify the senses of our soul, as our parents did for our physical um, senses. And there is that day when we will, when our eyes focus and we do connect with the eyes of God for the first time and he has that joy of knowing that we are seeing him and we recognize that he we are his child although much of what your parents and the adults in your life would have done would have been purposeful and intentional in their interaction with you most of it would have just been instinctive God has made it so that it is innate in us to interact with infants, with young children, in a way that stimulates their senses and contributes to their growth and development. We cannot help ourselves but in interact in a way with them that is helpful to them. And it's not just the adults around a child that contribute to their development. It's other infants, it's other children, even infants that may be smaller than them, younger than them. 
you know, the cry of another baby um, that the child will hear. And again, it's all just contributing to their growth and development. When my youngest brother Callum was about nine months old, my mum started looking after another boy who was um, a month older than him. When my mum first started looking after Peter, Peter could crawl but Callum couldn't. And my mum says that Callum had had no need to crawl. He had three older siblings that were very obliging and were quite happy to pass him whichever toy Callum indicated that he wanted. Now when we, Callum's older siblings, were out at school, he had Peter at home with him during the day. And Peter was, because he could crawl, he was also able to go and get the toy that Callum wanted. But Peter hadn't quite developed the art of then taking that toy to Callum. And Mum says the result of that was that Callum very quickly learned how to crawl for himself. So Peter was demonstrating to Callum the benefits of being able to crawl and that awakened in Callum a desire to crawl for himself and the ability to do so. And as if God has arranged it to be in the physical, that the family and the physical world that we have been born into is perfect for the stimulation of our senses and the exercise of them there, their full development and maturation so that we can go on and develop the skills and abilities we need to survive and then thrive in this world, such as walking and talking, as we've said, and many other skills. So it is in the spirit and with the exercise and the stimulation and the reawakening of the senses of our soul. God has arranged for us to be birthed into a kingdom the kingdom of light. He has translated us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It is the perfect environment for us that have be, that are spirit like God, but temporarily housed in physical bodies. To be reawakened and for us to receive once again from God um, through the spirit, his communication to us. And he has birthed us into a spiritual family that as we interact with our brothers and sisters, again, that awakens our senses, it stimulates them, it exercises them, it causes us to identify and realise, in fact, actually I can see God and hear God and even taste and smell and touch God. As we see the, our brothers and sisters enjoying those relationships and that communication with him, it awakens that within us. It makes us to realise that that is actually... Um, normal, that is how we um, are meant to be and God has created us and given us the ability to be like that too. So as I say, as we contribute, uh, sorry, as we live in family, as we engage with our spiritual family, we are all contributing to each other's the growth and development. The effect of living in the kingdom of God and interacting with our spiritual family is the same as we see on a flower where it turns to face the source of light. Nothing has physically come and um, turned the stem of that flower, but the flower cannot help itself but turn towards the light. Now we of being restored into that relationship with Jesus, sorry, with God through the sacrifice of Jesus. And the effect of being in God's kingdom, living in his kingdom of light and engaging with our family, interacting with our spiritual family, it is to cause the senses of our soul to be drawn and return to being spirit facing once again so we can uh, receive directly from the heart of God. And his word can be conceived in our hearts and we can deliver that to the rest of the body. And it is a beautiful thing. And this is a natural thing. It's not something that is forced that we can um, make happen. It's not something that we sit down and study and fires and then implement. It is just something that happens as we, as I say, live in his kingdom and we interact with our spiritual family around us. God has provided all that we need for life and godliness. Jesus has restored the spirit to spirit um, relationship 
and provision has been made for um, our soul and our body um, to come back into line with God and for the salvation that our spirits know to be outworked. It talks about in the Bible of working out your salvation and that work of salvation is worked out in, in our soul and in our body. I'm going to, to finish um, there. Having hopefully laid the foundation that we need to go on and talk more um, about receiving the word. The foundation being the knowledge and awareness that God desires relationship with you and I. And that he has created us with the ability for there to be two-way communication with us. And although sin utterly severed um, and separated us from God by severing that spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship, cutting the ability for there to be spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication, Jesus has perfectly restored us and God has birthed us into a kingdom and provided us with a family. The effect being, as we said, that it causes the senses of our soul to return to being spirit facing and we can receive the precious and life giving word of God. And once again, our natural minds benefit from being fed truth by our hearts and our interactions with the world around us are governed by truth and they become what God wants them to be and intends for them to be. So we see what God wants us to see, we hear what he wants us to hear and we taste and we touch and we smell what God wants us to feel and to taste and to smell. So Father, thank you that you desire us you desire to be in relationship with us. And Jesus, I thank you that you restored the relationship. You gave us what our hearts so longed for and needed. We didn't recognise at the time, but we desire to be restored to our Father. And while we were still dead in our sin, Jesus, you died for us. You made the way and the provision for us to be able to come back into the kingdom of light. I thank you that we are in the kingdom of light today and for anybody that isn't, it's if all they have to do is just say yes I want to be in that kingdom. I thank you that you are drawing people into your kingdom continuously God, you are bringing people back home. And for those of us that are in the kingdom, you are fully restoring the order of our being. You are returning us so that our hearts are faced towards you, so that we can receive directly from you. And I thank you for the brothers and sisters that you have placed around us. I thank you that as we enjoy fellowship with them, it is causing the senses of our soul to be reawakened, to be sensitised to you once again, God, so that we can receive from you. We can have the joy of your word being conceived within us. We can have the joy of it growing and developing inside us. And Lord, I thank you that you have given us physical bodies that are our tools and our servants, that we can then interact with the world around us and deliver that word to the people around us and Lord and we can see the fruit of that word we can see um, it's outworking God I thank you for calling us into your family I thank you for awakening us to you I thank you for um, calling us into being all that you made us to be Thank you that you interact with us and relate us in faith, knowing that one day we will connect with you in ways that we've never done before. And you will have the joy of that moment when we call your name in a new way and we call upon you and we receive from you in ways that you have been waiting for us to do so. God, I thank you that you love us so much. I thank you that you are so faithful to us and I thank you for what you're doing in our lives and in this body and in our church. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us today. I look forward to seeing you again on Easter Day. Have a great week and may the Lord bless you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore.
Amen. God bless you.